episode of the SDSU podcast is sponsored by Mars Energy Cream, the first ever topical energy delivery product. Think energy drink, but it's a lotion. It contains a proprietary blend of natural ingredients, including caffeine, taurine, and B vitamins to provide an energizing boost. And unlike traditional energy drinks and gels, Mars Energy Cream is sugar-free, contains no artificial flavors, colors, or preservatives. If you want to try it out, go to MarsEnergyDrinkCream.com and use the code Andre, spelled A-N-D-R-E, at checkout to receive 15% off a purchase of a 50 milliliter tube. Listening to the SDSU podcast presented by the East Village Times with your hosts Andre Hagberdian and Paul Garrison. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of the SDSU podcast. I am Andre Hagberdian, and I'm joined by Paul Garrison. What's going on, Paul? Going on, Andre. Things are great, brother. Uh, looking forward to recapping this this uh, UCLA game and. Talk a little bit more about Oregon State. So good stuff, brother. Yeah, you know, the UCLA game did not go as well as the Aztecs would have liked it to or their fans. You know, we knew heading into this four game stretch that started with UCLA that it would tell us a lot about this team. Mm-hmm. Two ranked Pac 12 teams. You know, UCLA was 27, so they technically weren't ranked before the game, but they are ranked now. So I'm right. calling them ranked for the sake of this conversation and then you know top two or three of a conference teams right after that you know there was this kind of discussion in the press box before the game about which set of two games is more important the two pack 12 games that give you a little bit more if you win gives you a little bit more national profile notoriety across the country or is it the mountain west games and your state is to win the conference and those two conference games are more important Right. And if you beat the two Pac-12 teams and then go and lose those two Mountain West games, like I don't think that's the best thing for the team overall. But it's just interesting to see how different people look at it. I mean, I know there's probably some fans out there that would want, would rather beat UCLA and Oregon State just for that national notoriety. But, you know, it really doesn't matter anymore because UCLA came and went and it was a loss. And, you know, now we're looking at Oregon State. So. What are your th- initial thoughts on, on, on that? Well, on that topic, I mean, I, I agree with you. You know, it, it, I, I find just fascinating, like the things that uh, social media and message boards and things like that. I, 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 I think all of that really like an interesting conversation. It seems like people, they just are no longer behind the style that San Diego State plays. I'm I'm really curious where the belief comes from that they can duplicate what UCLA does, like how that would ever be possible. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I, that that's the part of it that I'm interested in. So I think that it's probably the same crew who would rather, you know, look good beating those teams than actually do something of substance towards like a, a conference title. Yeah, I mean, I think the other part of that that discussion is on, you know, coaching. You know, I don't we don't necessarily do a grade for coaching. We might take it into account when we're when we're grading the positional units, but like we don't have a separate coaching grade. If we were grading coaching over these last two games, they would get a very low mark. And you know, that's not taken away from the talent gap between San Diego State and UCLA, but just that there's a lot of things that from the game plan to the what the person what personnel was in the game to some of the decisions, I believe they were really poor. And Coach Hoke said after the game, we have to coach better. And he says that all the time. A lot of coaches say that. And I actually asked them on Tuesday, what does that mean? What, what is it that the coaches need to do better? And and I was, I was not sure what kind of answer I was going to get. But I actually got a fairly good answer. And he specified, you know, okay, let's take the D-line. We look at how are they attacking double teams? How are they doing with their feet? When this uh, the offense alignment is coming this way and how are we doing the stunts, things like that. And those are things that coaches look at and say, okay, well, 
maybe we're not going to do the stunts this way or we're going to do it this differently. So I thought it was a it was a good answer, at least a better answer than I thought I was going to get when I asked the question. But I think it still goes back to, you know, you want to compete. You want to not look like you don't belong on the same field as a UCLA. The coaching can help that. And I don't think it helped them against UCLA. And, the, you know, the score is what the score was. Yeah, I, I I definitely agree with that. And I think, you know, the the number of assignment errors and things like that that took place to allow those big plays, you know, I, I definitely think that, that it's far from perfect. But, you know, I, I think what partly because of the score, you know, I don't think that they played Aztec football on mm. against UCLA. Um, I thought that they played exactly into UCLA's hands by refusing to really run up the middle very much by refusing to to uh, try to just grind out some possessions and, and take the air out of the ball. You know, I think they, they ultimately paid for it, bec- but primarily because of those big plays. I mean, you know, they're, which I thought was really, really surprising overall. I mean, coming into the game, San Diego State's two shortest scoring drives given up were six and eight yards. I'm sorry, six and eight plays. And yeah. to give a one, three, seven, and seven, you know, the, just their ability to score quickly, I thought was really, really surprising. And it, it, like I said, they're turning the page and go into there, but we get to talk a little bit more about some grades. All right, let's start with the quarterback. I, I'm going with a B minus on with Maiden. Wow. wow. And a lot of that, the reason why it's not a lower grade is because you got to factor in that there's two drop passes, touchdown passes in there. And if those are caught, you know, his stat line looks a lot better. You know, two more completions, 28 more yards, two more TDs, one less interception. The game might be closer. So maybe he doesn't turn, throw those other two interceptions because he's not trying to do too much when they're down a bunch. Um, the other reason why I think his grade is not as low as you might think is he did get hit pretty hard on a throw in the second quarter. Yep. Initially, I and looking at it live, it looked like he got hit in the head because he kind of got up a little wobbly and he needed to be helped up by a lineman. But the replay showed it was a shoulder first hit to the side. Right. And he got nailed. I, I didn't know this, but I was listening to the 760 a.m. Uh, post game report, and they kept saying that they were told that he had a, either a rib, a bruised rib, or a shoulder bruise or something. So I, they must have gotten that from somewhere, somewhere at, either either on the TV or San Diego State sideline or something. But I think that definitely aided maybe some of his issues throwing the ball or running the ball, hesit- hesitating, things like that. At the end of the day, he wasn't good enough to win the game. But with, with that injury issue and, you know, those two drop touchdowns that could have really changed how his stat line looked, I went with the B-. minus. I think it's a great call. Um, I think you were not the only one that missed it because the very next play, it was a read option and he didn't give up the ball. <laughs> so he took like another shot when, yeah. they went, when they when they went off the field for that drive. He went into the tent, you know, yeah. briefly to check that injury. I I, I think your grade is great. Um, and I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to go with your grade. Uh, I thought that of all of the players on San Diego State's team, he was the most competitive. There was a couple of times where he rolled out and made two guys miss before, you know, almost finding people and things like that. And, and I don't think he had any. I mean, they, they couldn't run the ball. And and so I thought that that was really detrimental. Um, I thought it was interesting in the press conference on Tuesday that Hoke said, you know, I thought we dropped back to pass too much. We got to yeah. get into play action. We got to do those kinds of things. And, and I thought that was very indicative because I think that's true is that is that Maiden continues to be at his best when he's playing off of the run game. And um, I thought that they they weren't committed enough to the run game, especially obviously, you know, if they fell well behind, but it was still a game not being able to find that. And um, I thought I thought really hurt them, which, you know, I guess goes into the running backs. You know, I thought aside from Keenan Christian, I thought they the the backs had a very bad day. I think that, uh, you know, I think I, I would go with a D for, for where they were. And, you know, whether it's not being able to pick up a first and goal at the one where, you know, you just need to not get 
submarine there if you're um if you're Jalen Armstead to you know it, dropping the pass yeah and you could you can say you know why do you got a five five guy out there getting the reception it was a little bit high um but it's a catch you got to make to kind of get back into the game I thought that they did well on some of the screen passes and I think that's been um Lindley's strength of his offense to this point uh, I am wondering and I, I said in the article that, that I wrote about it uh Keenan Christian he looked like somebody who belonged on that level yeah um, and I didn't I didn't necessarily think the rest of the running backs did and I just you gotta wonder like at what point do you just say like San Diego State needs to get some big plays and the guy who can get his big plays is Keenan Christian so we need to make sure he has the ball 20 times a game and I think they're at that point it's going to be really hard I think to to continue to march the ball down the field and I think that you know that, that featured back like he was the only guy who I thought was able in traffic to to kind of jump around a little bit, get positive yards, and I think he's close to figuring it out. You know, running inside, how to how to do that in a way that that you 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 can do it without losing a ton of speed, so you can still you know get that long game. I think he's close, um, but you know, overall, I just it wasn't you know obviously a good line. I thought poor for the running backs. I had him at a C minus, but mainly along the same lines as as you said. You know, 3.4 yards per carry overall for the backs, 27 yards total. Uh, nobody ran, nobody averaged more than 3.4 or 27 yards. The Blake, you know, that sweep on the second down, Blake, if he doesn't fumble it, maybe he gets the ball over the goal post or the goal line. Yeah, and then the drop pass, of course. I, I mean, I think Blake had a nice 20-yard, you know, screen pass that he caught. Kristen had a couple nice catches. That helped. I agree. Kristen looked like the only guy on the offense that looked like he could run around a, a defender or beat a guy one on one with his speed. Whereas the other guys, anytime they got the ball, it looked like they weren't going anywhere. And the tacklers and the defenders kind of converged. So yeah, C minus for the most, you know, most of the same reasons you said. Uh wide receiver. This is it's the wide receivers for the third week in a row are definitely the 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 toughest ones because they don't typically aren't that much involved in the offense. They were probably more involved in this game than they were in the first two weeks. Makai Shaw had a nice game, five catches, a touchdown, a back shoulder. Khalib Wesley was back. He had a couple nice catches. Uh, but the Josh Nicholson drop, I think, is the big big elephant in the room and um i gave him a b minus only because other than that they had no other drops they at times were open didn't get the ball i liked what i saw from from wesley and shaw curious as to why balen brooks didn't play much i think he got three snaps you know i can understand with wesley and nicholson now fully healthy that they got the majority of the snaps next to makai but uh, to think that Breon Penny and Balen Brooks couldn't get on the field for more than three or four snaps, uh, that was perplexing. But yeah, a B minus. But as I said, that one is kind of a wild card grade. Yeah, I, I have a hard time giving them that high of a grade because, you know, I thought Jalen Maiden was very competitive. But if you're going to, you know, they have, he has 37 passing attempts. And obviously he got sacked. So you're up over 40 passing attempts and your wide receivers only get seven, eight catches. I think that that is just a sign that they weren't open enough um, or they were unable to find them. Um, and, and if you're going to kind of make the passing game the center of your attack, I think you you, you just need more. And, you know, it's it's one thing to say, OK, well, they're an incomplete against Ohio. Well, maybe they're an incomplete against Idaho State. Now they're an incomplete against UCLA. It's hard to believe that, like, they're not contributing to it, especially again. I thought how how um, how competitive I thought Maiden played. So I, I really I think it's hard to, to give both of those. I think you gave them a B minus and I think you give the quarterback a B minus and they didn't get 200 yards. 
in the air and they had 40 attempts. You know what I mean? Like it, something, something, something is amiss. So yeah, I thought, I thought, you know, I thought Josh Nicholson um, and that drop obviously was huge, but I think it's also just huge for his development. I mean, he's a young guy. I asked Coach Hoke about, you know, post game, like, do you think that your team has kind of those breakaway players? Because, you know, I think ultimately expecting San Diego State to like piece together seven, eight, nine plays a drive in order to score, I think is is really tough. And I think in years past, it's been the same thing. And if they didn't get a big play from, you know, Jordan Bird or they didn't get a big play by somebody having, you know, a block punt or something of that nature, they had a, they have a hard time scoring points. You know, I think that's the case for most teams. And, and you know, I, I think they just need more. Um, you know, Makai Shaw, I thought he had a very, very good game. Um, but, you know, I don't think he is that that breakaway kind of guy. He's a possession receiver. Um, he's a guy who, if you can get it down inside of the 20 yard line, you know, can make some good things happen. He's a possession guy. I thought that he got open plenty. But, you know, they need people who can catch it and, you know, make a 30 yard game and, and, and really get those big chunks. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm not sure where Brooks is and where he's going to fall into that. But, you know, he, he seems more of the possession kind of guy than, than like that breakaway sort of stuff. And, you know, Breon Penny is, uh, you know, I think he has a little bit more of that stretching the field. But overall, I think the wide receivers, given the fact that they were the focal point of the offense, I, I think that, that I have to give them a D to, to you know, just D plus because just of, of what overall the passing game did. Tight ends. I, I would probably go with a B. They had seven catches on 12 targets. Jay Rudolph had a couple. Mark Rabin had five. Very low yardage. But they converted some first downs. No drops. Uh, had had one penalty. Could they have obviously done more? Sure. Um, but I believe like they, they caught the most of the passes that were their, their way. They didn't have any drops. Could have been more involved, you know, considering that on the on the perimeter, you, as you as you mentioned, they weren't able to get big plays. Uh, could have had could have utilized the tight ends a little bit more uh, in line. You know, I, I would have with no Cam Harpole. You know, coach mentioned him that he was a, a guy that does a good job blocking, and they missed him. Logan, we thought Logan Tanner would replace him and play more. He only had a couple snaps, I think. He had one – they threw to Tanner one time in the flat. That was a little overthrown. But but otherwise, I mean, I, I would say that the tight ends were, were okay for this game. That's interesting, man. I, 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 I would always kind of put them with a little bit of a running game and blocking for them since that's a key to what they did. And I, I didn't think they got much push. And especially because since they weren't running a lot inside, they were running behind the tight ends a whole bunch. That's kind of where Lindley's offense to this point has been. Um, so again, I, I thought it, I didn't think it was a good offensive performance on um, on Saturday that would like constitute a lot of really high grades. So I'd have the same D that that I think kind of has been around. You know, it, it, they 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 put up ten points. However, that should have happened, and maybe you know you could say, well, they would have gotten more if it wasn't for the drop, but they got the drop, or you know, the touchdown late that. They they dropped a pass again. Well, they only got that because the defense got a turnover and gave it to them at the one. Um, so I thought there was a lot of points that they left out there, and um, you know, it, it's just it's the it's it's just the question like who are the playmakers offensively in in terms of catching the ball? And I think at this point, their running backs have been maybe their best receivers. You know, that just given what they need from the tight end position. You know, I think mean, it's hard to say that that even given what they have, that they that they shouldn't um, have. You know, they left more out there, and they shouldn't have done more. Yeah, the only caveat that I would have to that is, like, who are they being asked to block? They're being asked to block outside linebacker that could be a first round draft pick, or they're being asked to block a lot bigger, stronger linebackers. You could you could see that they're not going to be as effective run blocking against. A, a big, strong, strong, athletic team like UCLA over, you know, some of the other teams. But I get what you're saying. Oh, no, no, I mean, but I mean, the flip side of that is, you know, if your tight ends are supposed to be your best players, somebody has got to block them. Somebody has got to be able to, to do that. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's hard. Like, like the quarterback got it. You gave the quarterback a B. 
the run, a running backs a B, the wide receivers a B, the tight ends a B, and it's like I didn't, it, 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 I didn't, I didn't feel like the offense like played well. You know? I didn't give the running backs a B. What'd you give them? C minus. So they were average. The offense, like, why was it bad if all these positions like did good? Well, we haven't gotten to the offensive line yet. Okay, what was the offensive line? I had another D. First play of the game, Keenan Christian gets the ball and is met with two defenders, loses four yards. Second drive, they got a first. He, I think he got six yards on the first down play. They get a first yard, first drive, first down, and then on the second first down, same. He gets minus five because he gets the ball and there's two defenders there. Uh, that was just kind of a sign that the offensive line was not blocking anybody throughout the game. There were not many holes. We talked about the running backs and how little yardage they got. It's, you can fault the running backs for their production and this and that, but ultimately, if they have no holes to run through, there's a reason, you know, what? how much can they do, right? The offensive line had two penalties. I think they had one more that was declined because it was going to be fourth down. So, you know, they were they were just they were they did not have a good performance. Burn, BCD was back, morale moved to right guard for the first time. You know, you thought that that would help experience wise, but uh, for one game it didn't. Now that could be the competition. They they're probably not going to play a defensive line as good as UCLA the rest of the season. Oregon State has a good defensive line, but they're not as heralded as as UCLA, so uh, overall, I gave him a D. Yeah, I have the same grade. I I, I just thought that the, the blame for the offense kind of gets shared. I think going to your point about about how big and physical um, UCLA was, you know, I just I, I'm not sure how much help they got from like the design of the plays and things of that nature either. You know, it was it was it was a tough game offensively. You know, I think that uh, and defensively uh, as we'll get into. But I thought again of, of yeah. It, of all of the the bright spots and the things you want to look at, you know, Jalen Maiden and just his competitiveness and the fact that, you know, there were some plays that he absolutely made. Um, there's somebody left out there. His accuracy is, is what it is. Even given all of that athleticism and all the things he did at UCLA, like he was running around, guys. He would be this other person, I would say, in addition to Chris Dunn who did that. You know, you're, you're going to have tough games. And then the question, I think, going forward is, is, you know, is this who they are? Because I think that every team from here on out, you know, they're going to try to stop the run and they're going to, they're going to try to make the passing game show that they can, that they can do something. Um, because obviously, you know, when you lose 35 to 10, that's going to set the script for, that's going to set the script for everybody else, right? They're going to try to duplicate that. All right. Moving on to the defense. Defensive line, what did you have for them? You know, I thought the defensive line had a tough time. Honestly, I don't necessarily think, you know, I, we always talk, I always talk about grading on a curve and the expectations for the unit. And, you know, I honestly thought that of all of the, I actually didn't think they played all that bad. You know, it's, it's hard to know what UCLA would have done if they didn't have those big plays. Like, would they have put up the same amount of points? But if you take away the big plays, um, which I think you can kind of pin more, so two of them especially, on the um, on the secondary or the linebackers, then the, then the line doesn't look quite as bad. So I thought they played okay, uh, which I so I would give them a C. I think obviously the long run um, and just not being there at all, you know, I thought that was something um, you know that they obviously needed to be better at. The rushing yards and things like that, um, you know, I didn't count them, but I think a lot of that was late. And I thought they did okay against the run for the most part, you know, and, and, you know, I think that's what you want them to do. And again, I, I don't think necessarily that you're expecting your line to be what the line was last year. The linebackers, I thought, made plays, which means they were relatively clean in terms of just like who was blocking them. I thought Garrett Fountain had a nice game. I thought he was active, snuffed out a few screens, and and just was around the ball. So I gave him a C. I went with a C minus. Fountainhead was active. Daniel Poco had two tackles for loss and a sack. They did some nice stuff considering who they were going up against. Uh, but I think there were too many times where they were 
getting pushed around. They talked about how they needed to be better, generate more pass rush without having to blitz multiple guys. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with most of what you said, and a C minus is where I had them, but along the same lines as your C. Yeah, yeah. Linebackers. Yeah, linebackers, I thought, you know, if there was a, a never a time where you could, like, have a grade for one player and then everybody else, yeah. this would be, like, the perfect time. Um, I thought Zyrus Fusayu uh, was terrific. Obviously, he had the forced fumble. Um, that fellow linebacker, Trey White, was able to get. But, you know, he just – he had the look of somebody who, again, was competitive. And yeah. I, I'm not really sure that you can say too much of that. You know, however, it's always hard to know who had what responsibility. But like in the press conference on Tuesday, it sounded like it sounded like New Zealand Williams on the on the first section was lined up wrong. If you're asking a linebacker to cover um, that player in the slot with no help over the top, that's a pretty big ask. Um, even if he was used to be a, a former DB, and so if if, if that's the case of who was supposed to be there and you know maybe it's those game of inches and being lined up inside prevents them from throwing it or something but you know just I thought that there was there was a lot of that um I thought that that you know with him getting his his first start I didn't think that the linebackers were as physical against the run you know after Cody Moon's first game you know where he was the conference player of the week and really looked good you know, he he obviously has, has fallen off in some regard. So overall, I think that because of the way that, you know, the G, aside from that one play by PSA who didn't turn out to be as significant as maybe it, it should have, maybe the, the linebackers made a lot, but I think PSA is enough to get them into that C range. Yeah, yeah, I had B minus just because of Zyrus. Okay, that's where I almost did that. Um, yeah, the, I thought that New, that New Zealand Williams play was interesting because, and we're talking about the 81 yard touchdown, right. the first touchdown of the game to Josiah Norwood. When I saw the play, I thought it was a zone. I thought it was a cover three, and I thought it was Marcus Ratcliffe who had the middle zone. And I saw him bite on the fake to the running back and move up and kind of open up that middle. And I thought that New Zealand was the zone flat on the outside or the short. And so my initial thought was, okay, that was Marcus Ratcliffe's missed assignment. But the way, as you just said, Brady said, I don't know if he said he lined up wrong, but he was like, he was supposed to be inside of him as opposed to. Yeah. 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 And in terms of like, they didn't want, they wanted to show him still closer to the line of scrimmage, maybe to disguise that they're in man. But like they they didn't want him. I think when the play happened, he went straight outside. He lined up straight on him to kind of give away what was going on. Yeah, and I think they, they didn't want him to go as far to the outside. They wanted him to he stay in the side. Still, it's not bad. Yeah, yeah, and so I was surprised by that. I'm glad he said that, or I'm glad he clarified that because it's it's, it's hard. Like no matter. What knowledge of football you have or what you see, like, unless you know what the actual play was, you could be fooled, like, b- by what you see, right? And so I'm glad he said that. But, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's tough. The overall defense struggled with a lot of missed assignments. And sometimes it's, as we're, we'll talk when we get to the safeties about some other ones, it's, not, it's hard to really know who is at fault or what the play call was. But... At least with the linebackers, I think with Zyrus's play, he had 12 tackles, the two forced fumbles, recovered one. You know, he was flying around the ball, flying around the field. And I think, you know, the other guys, you know, Cody Moon didn't start. And I agree with you, you know, he didn't start last week either. But he still played 43 snaps. He's played a lot more snaps than New Zealand Williams. But you didn't necessarily uh, feel him in the game. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, that's definitely a, <laughs> a hoax statement. But like, he, he played yeah, right. a lot. I was surprised to see that he played like more than double the snaps as New Zealand Williams. But like, it was hard to like know. Okay, Cody Moon made that play, like he did in Week One, where he was everywhere. So I don't know. Something I I, I still think the linebackers are a good group. We'll yeah, I, I would say that they're kind of like 
I would say like given the expectation because of how well they played in spring and how play, how well they played in the fall and how well they played in the first couple of games, you know, I think they're like the tight ends where, you know, you, you might be able to forgive another position like the D line or the wide receivers for not having those huge games, but you're not necessarily hoping that that's what's going to lead you there. And, and, you know, the inflection point of the defense has been those linebackers. And so you need them to do more. And I think, you know, in that grading on a curve, you know, that I think that, that they didn't like they, they, the game was in their hands and they needed them to make plays. Um, you know, whether it was the D line missing that one assignment, well, where's the linebacker filled up? You know, yeah. it, it, it makes it hard afterwards. Well, yeah, it makes it hard afterwards. But again, if, if they do, they don't look like this gaping thing because the linebackers, you know, were able to, to figure it out and play better than, you know, maybe what, what they would have otherwise. So I, I think uh, because they're so important, you know, I, I think it's, it's easier to, to say like they, they didn't play quite up to what they needed to do. Still think Cooper McDonald has turned into a, a pretty good pass rusher through three games. If, if there's hope that they can figure out a way to start creating pressure with four, you know, I think it, I think it starts with with Cooper McDonald because I think you know teams are starting to give him more attention and and I thought that you know he continued to to play a decent role in being able to at least keep them honest a little bit with with um, that and I think it's going to be important because you know this upcoming week the quarterback for Oregon State his arm is so strong that he can he can really hold the ball for a long time. And, you know, if they let him do that, I think, you know, it, it, it could be um, a pretty challenging day for the Aztecs. Yeah, heading to uh, corners. Um, I had him at a C. You know, I think in one benefit, you've got J. Mike. You hold him to two catches for 23 yards, which is good because that guy had 130-something and, and a 62-yard touchdown the week before. But one of those, it was a missed tackle by Des Malone that went from a six-yard catch to a 12-yard catch. The play before and the play after that were pass interference from Des Malone. I saw a lot on chatter on social media about those calls being, you know, BS. But the first one, he tugged on his jersey pretty blatantly before the pass was thrown. So it could have been more of a holding than a PI, but in, in college, it doesn't really matter. I think it's only a five-yard difference. Second one was a little bit more hand back and forth hand fighting that I think maybe could have been, you know, let go. But I do think by the letter of the law, he did interfere with the pass. So I don't necessarily think that they were as, you know, bad calls as I think some were making out to be. Otherwise, you know, they didn't throw, you know, as I said, Sertivan didn't really get a lot of targets the rest of the game. But obviously they didn't need him because they scored 35 points and had multiple guys uh, catch touchdowns. But Noah Tumblin, I don't think he got too many passes his way. It looks like just PFF has him only getting two targets, giving up one pass for 11 yards. Man, we are, we are, this is fun. We're, we're uh, opposite to the end of the game. I, absolutely. I, I think that, yes, the All-American first round pick got a couple calls from the ref. That's going to happen. I absolutely think that both of those could have not been called and there are way more egregious things that probably happened during the game that didn't get called but he's a star stars are going to get calls they were two on one drives and after that they were none i'm going to say a minus because i do think that there were a couple of times where they had like third and one and malone just inexplicably was like six yards off the guy um i thought that his tackling you know as he maybe played a lot of snaps he, you know, maybe he, he got a little bit lazy there. Again, I, I didn't think that UCLA did their damage on the outside. Uh, maybe you want more from run support, but they 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 really attacked in the middle of the field. And the big play was to the middle of the field. The other touchdown was to the middle of the field. I, I thought that they tried to go outside. I thought they they attempted to do that, um, especially towards Malone. Uh, I mean, you know. I don't know how many snaps people outside of Tumblin got, but if you're covering well enough and that passing barrage only got two passes directed towards your, your way, like that's blanket coverage. I mean, that's, that's as good as you could possibly get. 
aside from being like a Deion Sanders type corner where you goat them into throwing it so you can pick it. You know what I mean? So I, I actually thought that the the lineback, I mean, sorry, the the corners, I thought they played very, very well. And I thought that there was questions about, you know, how good are they? And like, they're not going to be perfect. And I think they wound up, I mean, if, even if you give those those pass interference calls, I mean, you're, you're talking like what, how many total receptions to targets and things of that nature, and not very many of them are downfield. If, if your worst play is, it was a six yard pass and you missed the guy and it became a 12 yard gain. It's not like, you know what I mean? They didn't give up 87. So I, I thought the, 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 the cornerbacks have played very well. Um, I thought they played so well. In fact, that I thought that Johnson and branch Dallas branch, Chris Johnson, I thought they would play more. And I thought that if they did, if, 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 Tumbling wasn't playing or somebody wasn't playing that like, man, maybe they should get fresher legs or whatever, whatever. But I thought they played so well that it's like there's a noticeable difference when the starters are um, on the bench. And, you know, I thought when Branch came in at the end of the second half, like UCLA was there. Like, we're going to throw right at Branch when, when he came in and, you know, and they got two easy receptions to the outside that just weren't there. That just weren't there for the most part when Tumlin and Malone was there. And yeah, not perfect, but man, I, I, I think if they do that the rest of the year, I think you can make a, a, I mean, that's, I think you can, I think if, if they can do the rest of the year, what they've done in the first three games, I mean, I, I think you start going and saying, okay, when has San Diego State had a better pair of, of quarterbacks? I think they've been really good or potentially the middle of the field defense has been porous enough that they're like well, why are we going to go outside when we can do whatever we want inside branch played 22 snaps chris johnson played 18 so it was a little bit more than i remembered just watching the game live but um safeties i, I thought i had the worst grade out of the defense on them out of d and this is even after finding out from coach oak that mm-hmm. Ratcliffe mm-hmm. wasn't the missed assignment i thought Ratcliffe looked like a true freshman yeah. Um, you know, the second play, second drive, you know, we talked about Josh Nicholson and Martin Blake dropping touchdowns. You know, the second drive of the game, Logan Loya beat Ratcliffe over the middle and dropped the pass that would have gone probably for a 60, 70 yard touchdown. Now, I think there was a defensive lineman that dropped into a zone blitz and like got his hand up, but didn't touch it. And I think that might have maybe. Um, distracted Loya, but it still got hit Loya in his hands, and he straight dropped it. But that that could have been another sixty plus yard touchdown early in the game. And I believe Ratcliffe was the one that was uh, ha- covered him coming out. Uh, Deshaun McEwen got his first start. You know, I thought it was because to match up with speed and athleticism. Um, I asked Coach Hoke after the game, and he kind of shot that down. But you know, he, in, in his first appearances, you know he didn't have a great performance. There was that one, the lawyer's actual touchdown, which came after a big play over the middle. I don't know. Who, him, right. That was, he was your man. Yeah. I was yeah. Nobody had him. <laughs> no, I was like, yeah. And it was that was things where you're sitting there and, and you see him. He's, he's, yeah. he's standing there, you know, and that's, you know, again, I mean, maybe the coaches could see him calling something out or something. So they went, so they caught a, uh, I I forget who the receiver was, but he caught a pass over the middle, like 30 something yards. And they went quick. Not only did they do no huddle, but they snapped the ball as soon as they got to the, to the the line of scrimmage. Yep. yep. And they were not like, I think the, the, the field warrior safety and uh, Ratcliffe, who was the Aztec, both went to the left. It looked like they were almost discouraged by the previous play and just automatically went to the left side of the defense without looking at where they lined up and not realizing that there was two wide receivers on the right and two on the left. Yeah. And this left slot got on there on the offense's left, the defense is right. And they, I don't know whose I, um, assignment that is, whether that was the field warrior up. or the, but they obviously blew that and wide open touchdown. So there was a lot of breakdowns there, a lot of youth and experience. Um, you don't want to see that because you're already up against a real, a more talented group. You're dealing with a five-star quarterback. You're dealing with potential first-round wide receiver. 
You, you, you just can't have those mistakes to give them those easy touchdowns because they're, guess what? They're probably going to get a touchdown anyway, but make them earn it and not give them that easy one. And, uh, I mean, and it goes, but I mean, holding them to three is just a huge, yeah, momentum and all of those kinds of things. And if, if they're able to do that on a couple of them yeah. and get that one touchdown in the third quarter, like the game, the game becomes stressful in the fourth. And, you know, who knows what happens at that point? Yeah. But I that kind of, but that kind of goes back to my point about coaching is, Starting McEwen at that position was mm-hmm. that a great idea, personnel wise? You know, Devon Celestine has been playing that position, right? You know, you could think that he hasn't been playing, he made mistakes or whatever, but he's played that position for now 15 games. Like, experience wise, you, you didn't see that from him or the secondary when he was out there. That, that maybe that's that goes back to some of the coaching things we were talking about in the beginning. But overall, I thought the safety play was was poor. I and I agree with you. Um, I, I thought it was poor as well. Um, Ratcliffe not being the person who was responsible lowered my linebacker grade that I had, and it raised the safety grade. So I I I, I thought that that um, I gave them a D as well. I had them lower than that um, prior to that. But uh, but I I I everything I said really well, and I will say, if they have a sample size with the De, um, Devon Celestine and Devon Celestine is close enough to Sedarius Barfield, who's had interceptions, and you know I thought I thought they needed more from him, um, and this is the kind of game that your best player needs to shine and do something, um, and and really step up. But if they're so similar in their skill sets that they realized that they're going to need somebody else on that other side. And, um, you know, I thought that they they had a lot of Sean McEwen, a lot of Eric Butler. And if they think that just a more athletic, physical presence is what they're going to need, honestly, I, I, I think it's completely fine to put them in a preseason game. And I'm calling it preseason because it's not the conference schedule. Yeah. Um, because Because he hadn't played. Except, except in like garbage time, and so like I think you need to get him in the offense or the defense, and you need to figure out what you have. We did ask again and Coach Hope about that, and he and he said it could look different next week. I thought it was interesting because you know against Idaho State, I I, I asked the question to Hope, you know, you know, I said, Coach Ohio through in the middle of the field, tons of success. Idaho State, tons of success. Is this an issue? And he said, Oh no, it's not an issue. But there's some other things we could do depending on the team. But then, of course, they they substitute out a guy who's played a lot of football for them. So, you know, I think after you watch the tape and coach always talks about that, like it's difficult after the game to just be able to give everything and you watch the tape and you kind of understand it at a different level. Um, but they were clearly concerned because of the what they did with the personnel and, and how they did. You know, I, I think that you saw the athleticism on display, um, but. I think that there was just uh, the, the, his body did not, in his mind, they were not in sync. Um, you know, a, a good example of it, I think, was uh, the film McKinnon is now referring to. Uh, he, he um, the lawyer, he, he, he was covering him. And for some reason, no matter how good of a game that he's had, and like his role is to cover that guy, his head was in the backfield. And the, they, they, they called it incomplete at first, and then the, the replay came and showed that it was a good game. I just think that, you know, a little bit more of that discipline, you know, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I'm, I'm really curious where Marcus Ratcliffe is, you know, they even as late as last week, they played um, Barfield in um, the Aztec position. And I, I, you know, with the athleticism that Butler has and McEwen, like I would wonder, you know, is there three best safeties going to be Butler, McEwen and Barfield at Aztec. And, you know, you kind of can, that all around kind of, I don't know, that the Aztec position is, you're going to have like your oldest, most instinctual player. Um, the flip side of it is, you know, like there, there, there are, the Ratcliffe has had moments where he's looked just fine. And, and you would assume that he's going to be better against Oregon State than he was against UCLA. But, you know, young guys are finicky that way, man. Um, and, and so I think that, that them trying to figure out how to to make sure you know again i don't know the kid well enough to know he seems like his head's in the right place 
and that he won't get down on himself or he won't start playing slow. He won't start second guessing and he'll make mistakes. He's going to make mistakes. He's going to make them fast. You know, like even if he was the person to blame on that deep play or whatever, and, it, and, and those kinds of things, like he didn't, he didn't get caught surfing, you know, he bit on the run and he played fast and yeah, you don't, for a young guy, you know, mistakes are going to happen, but you want them to happen at full speed kind of a thing. And now if he's going to start thinking, you know, that's going to be an issue. But they, they, they just need more. They need more from the, the safeties. That has been the defense's, you know, weakest spot, I think, which, you know, nobody really expected. Although I guess maybe we kind of did because, you know, Patrick McMorris left. Uh, he, he, you know, he had a Patrick McMorris play. Um you want to talk about a year, like if you could switch schedules and how everything would change. I think San Diego State, at least by just the game that I saw, Auburn and Cal, San Diego State could beat both of those teams. If you are having trouble sleeping, you need to watch those two teams play offense. It was it was tough. Four minutes left, Cal needed a stop to be able to get back into the game. And they dump it off to a receiver, and here comes Big Morris, and he gets his hand, and he causes a fumble, and you know Cal didn't do anything with it, but he gave him a great opportunity to the game um, late, and uh, you know that's he would be, you know, a, he would be a huge piece, obviously, to to what they were trying to do and and where they're at, but um, you know overall, I think this, they just need a lot more from their safeties, and you know until they can figure out how to the middle of the field teams are going to continue to go after it all right real quick let's go over special teams brown uh, kicking first of all uh was that your question that got yeah. Kurt Pope to start doing a punting demonstration at the yeah conference? that was, that that was pretty clutch yeah i like that <laughs> <laughs> uh, you i know, wasn't sure I, I wasn't sure what he was going to do when he stepped away from the podium and like started doing like a kicking uh Pose like he was a punter. Yeah. He actually like stepped up into like where we're. It was funny. It was great. It was great. But I, you know, I thought his first two punts were NFL like. The first yeah. two kicks of the game, they were just that boom, and you know, and then and fair caught him, and or the, you know, defense is down there. Um, and then I didn't think that the rest of them were uh, like to that level. And I think if he's able to get that consistency, you know, I think that that's. That's where they need him to be. Uh, it's it's hard not to mention the 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 Buffalo Bills having a college kick in overtime yesterday that allowed them to set up, um, especially considering they they cut Matariza um, after drafting him, which you know everyone can understand. But you know there's been time to be able to get bring him back. You know I, I think that he can turn into a huge weapon for them. You know no one likes to hear it because I I think people would rather you know lose in a sexy way. But if they can get back to their script of like a strong running game. And start playing ball control and start trying to pin teams back and win those win kind of the back and forth. I think they've lost that element where field position isn't like a huge thing for them. And I think they yeah. need to get to that. I think they need to, you know, I think they need to get I think and I think Browning can be that weapon for them where where you might you might not get a first down, but you punt it and then you pin them back and you gain 20 yards on the exchange. And I think that that element to San Diego State's game has not been present yet this year. And I think getting to that ball position, field position battle and really trying to invest in that, I think, is really, really good. So overall, though, I also thought that um, as far as the kicking is concerned, you know, Josh Nicholson drops the touchdown in the end zone and you see the the like frustration from his teammates like, oh, that was the play. That was the play. Uh, and obviously, it it kind it snowball a little bit later on on the Aztecs. But where would they have been if 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 um, Browning hadn't come in and nailed that kick? Like that, that, I thought. I thought in that moment, it kept them in the game. I thought it was a very clutch kick that they absolutely needed. He left. It was no doubt, and he crushed that 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 kick. Um, I would I would have given him an A on the day. I thought he did just fine. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I had a B plus. I'm gonna go B. I'm gonna go B. Yeah, he had, he didn't he didn't keep that going. B. Yeah, I do think that you're right. Like last year, how many times did they pin guys in, inside the five, inside the ten, flip field position? He didn't really do that in this game. Mm-hmm. I think he had one inside the twenty. 
you know, that's not a knock on him. I think we're just used to him doing that so well and so often that you get I mean, you look at some of these other guys, like the three guys that they've the three teams that San Diego State has played, their punters have not punted well. Right. And so their averages are so poor. And so Browning's numbers still look really good compared to the opposition. It's just not what we're used to with him from last year. So, but uh, yeah, I, I think he, he'll be fine in that in that regard. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Return. Okay, return coverage. I don't remember necessarily seeing anything egregiously bad. I mean, I'd give them a, a, a B. You know, Makai Shaw had two returns. I think for like fifteen yards, they caught everything. They didn't fumble. You know, they didn't give up any long returns on kickoffs. So I think it was fine. I mean, one thing I will say, we, we've we through three games, we have yet to see any kind of fakes. And I wonder, and maybe this is getting too early into the uh, Oregon State preview, but I wonder if, you know, Doug Beacon is staying up, the you know, <laughs> Oregon State special teams to cook something up for this Saturday. Yeah, you know, I, I thought, I, I you know, and I think the, the most frustrating part about this game against UCLA is the score was the same as so many of the games that they've had in the past, but the way that it happened was very, was different. The narrative is where these big teams get you is on special teams. And you can't hold your own against special teams. And, and that has absolutely been the case with uh, so many of these big um, Power 5 schools when they played San Diego State. But I thought San Diego State's special teams was better than UCLA, which means that the talent level in terms of athleticism, you know, wasn't as great as maybe the score would have indicated. You know, I thought the skill position players for UCLA were superior to the skill position, especially at wide receiver. Than San Diego State defensive line, I thought that was that was you know hugely different. But I thought San Diego State's corners played better than the UCLA's corners. The special teams is was it's supposed to be the place where the Power Five have the advantage, and I thought San Diego State had better special teams. You know, it's interesting because I'm not sure what kind of return game they're ever going to have with, with Makai Shaw. I don't know that he has the explosiveness to offer you what Jordan Bird had. Des Malone as many plays as he's getting at cornerback. I'm not sure you can also put him back there over there, you know, but I remember at one point in the game thinking, man, they need a punt return. Like they're going to need something big on special teams. And then Makai Shaw (laughs) caught a punt that I would guarantee you every other player on the team would have dropped. (laughs) And it was just, it was just such a skillful play that you're like, ah, that kind of makes up for any lack of explosiveness. Like you have to catch that ball. Um, and, 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 and so, you know, I, I thought he did just fine. I didn't think that UCLA got loose very much. Obviously the yards bared out. Um, you know, it was nice to see Keenan Christian return a kick. Um, and, you know, I think again, it's the same thing. The more touches that he can get, I think he's going to figure out how to get started to get some of those big plays. Um, but, you know, I think they were just fine. Would give him a B. I think they did just fine. And, and, you know, um, that's the piece though of the formula where they, you know, where, where they, Start playing some of that that ball possession game. Start playing some of that field possession game. Excuse me, but then you know part of that is you get a big play on special teams, and and it'll be it remains to be seen if if they have the, the the pieces that can do it. But it shows what a good job they do on special teams that they were better than the top twenty five team in that element. Yep, there you have it. Those are our grades from the uh, the loss to UCLA. Paul and I will be right back to talk preview the Oregon State game, so uh, stay tuned for that. This episode of the SDSU podcast is sponsored by Mars Energy Cream, the first ever topical energy delivery product. Think energy drink, but it's a lotion. It contains a proprietary blend of natural ingredients, including caffeine, taurine, and B vitamins, to provide an energizing boost. And unlike traditional energy drinks and gels, Mars Energy Cream is sugar-free, contains no artificial flavors, colors, or preservatives. If you want to try it out, go to MarsEnergyDrinkCream.com and use the code Andre, spelled A-N-D-R-E, at checkout to receive 15% off a purchase of a 50 milliliter tube. This week, San Diego State travels to Corvallis to take on the Oregon State Beavers. 
16th and 17th ranked teams in both polls. Aztecs are 24 and a half point underdogs. I, I think it's been about a decade since they've been underdogs by that much. It's the last non-conference game, right? It's a chance to get to three and one. It's a chance to, you know, go into a conference season with a huge victory. Right. But it's also win or lose a chance to kind of get your last evaluation from the coaching staff for the offense and the defensive players and special teams to see, you know, who's going to be those guys that are going to be the starters and the main backups heading into conference season. You're heading up to uh, Corvallis or actually Portland, I should say. Uh, are you all packed and ready to go? No, not at all. Mm. Yeah. That was like a typical, typical ma- uh, male. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get there. I'll get there. You know, I always uh, joke around with my wife that we're not like, we're not going on a safari where we can't just go to Walmart if, if we need it. But yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we'll be in Corvallis. Uh, our our um, photographer, Don DeMars, he's also making the trip. Uh, so, you know, give give the coverage that, that we hope to give. And um, it's fun, you know, when you get to branch out a little bit more and do things that you hadn't done before. So uh, the goal and the plan is to to do this for every road game and see where that takes us. This is your first road game as in the press box? It is, yeah. It is the first road game. And what's what's even funnier is I don't sit in the press box at Snapdragon very often. So, you know, it's just it's just a completely different experience that that definitely looking forward to. And it's you know, it's the second time that I'll have been at the stadium, but obviously I haven't been up there since they did the renovation. And uh I actually think of all of the stadiums that I visited, I in my mind, minus like as maybe as I don't know, college campuses can be green, but it's in my mind what Snapdragon will eventually be. Yeah. And just the fact that it's like in the middle of campus, you, you you walk around and you feel like you're on a campus and then you get to the stadium. Definitely looking forward to it. Tough game, huge game, man. What are, what are some of the keys that, that you see for the Aztecs um, on Saturday? Well, from a, from a defensive perspective, they're playing a, an offense that's just as explosive and just as talented as UCLA. You know, you're dealing with instead of a five star true freshman quarterback, you're dealing with a five star retro junior quarterback, DJ Uli Agale. I think nice. I said that right. Nice. I'm calling him DJ. Yeah. You know, when I was watching the San Jose State Oregon State game on YouTube the other day, and they, they just kept calling him DJ U. <laughs> there you go. So I'm going to go with DJ U from now on. DJ but I, at least I said it right the first time, or I think I said it right. Absolutely. But he's, I mean, he was the number one rated player in the country in the, in the class of 2020. You know, he played well at Clemson. You know, Clemson didn't have the success that they were used to with Trevor Lawrence and Deshaun Watson. And so it seemed like the the fan base kind of turned on DJ. It seemed like the coaching staff, you know, benched them at some points last year. And so, you know, he ended up transferring. Now he's at Oregon State, but he's a super talented player big strong great arm hangs in the pocket can run it and then they got Damian Martinez who was I think rated the number one running back in the Pac-12 preseason really good fresh wretched freshman year last year has added to that so far in two games I mean against UC Davis he only had seven carries but got 104 yards like he didn't That's think average. about how San Diego State's running backs we just talked about how they could nobody could get more than 3.4 yards per carry. And this guy is getting, you know, what, 15, 14 yards, 15 yards per carry. I mean, he's super talented. I think the Aztecs, they're going to have to stop the run. Yeah, They're going to have to get pressure with four. You know, if you add Cooper McDonald with the three defense alignment and not have to blitz five or six or blitz and bring five or six guys, because if you don't get there immediately, He's DJ is going to find open guys, you know, all across the field. So, I th- and those are the keys are just you got to be be able to get pressure on DJU with four, and uh, make him uncomfortable, and hopefully you get some turnovers. They haven't turned the ball over there. I think one of like nine teams in the country that haven't turned the ball over. They've only played two games. A lot of teams have played three. So, 
it's going to be an uphill battle. Definitely not. Um, if they thought US UCLA was a tough offense to defend, this one uh, might be a bit tougher. Yeah, I think the, the thing the Aztecs defensively have to be able to answer is the number of big plays that they give up actually who they are. The big plays that UCLA got were the surprise, right? I don't think anyone expected that to happen. And and with, you know, the number, right? Like maybe you have one or two, but also the variety of them in, in the sense that sometimes, you know, there's going to be a slant where you're blitzing everybody and somebody misses a tackle and it goes or something like that. It didn't really seem like in any of the big plays, like they beat anybody. It was just... Yeah, the, the they were wide team. open. They were wide open. And so I think that just by being able to be competitive and not have those kind of broken coverage, whatever that was, you know, I think they have the potential to do a little bit more in, in terms of just being better than than that. I think um, red zone is going to matter. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I can see the Aztecs being able to win a game um, like this, even with the big being big underdogs, you know, if if they score in the red zone and Oregon State kicks four field goals, you know, and 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 making up, maybe they're not going to have as many scoring opportunities, but kind of making that up because they are scoring touchdowns while Oregon State and I think is is kicking field goals, and I think you know the same thing would have gone for UCLA, and I think you know in predicting our scores and stuff like that, there was always field goals that was factored in there because. He had five scoring opportunities and scored five touchdowns, you know, six maybe if you include the, the fumble. And I think that's just what they're going to have to be able to figure out because it, teams are going to make them – teams are going to make – are going to keep – they're going to see the tape of what UCLA did. And if Oregon State is able to do the same thing and kind of confuse them and not have people pick up the right people and do everything, you know, I think that's – they're they're going to have to prove it, that they can just stop that. Another thing I'm really paying attention to is it's interesting. I'm I'm not 100% sure um, where DJU is more dangerous, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, I actually think that they might be better off playing man and not allowing, not allowing the Oregon State wide receivers to make double and triple moves. I think where I saw um, DJU being dangerous is when they dropped a whole bunch, they couldn't get pressure, and he just, Held on to the ball and held on to the ball and held yeah. on to the ball and held on to the ball and then threw it. You know, it's a 20 yard gain, but he throws it diagonal across the field. And so it's this on a line, you know, 50 yard kind of a thing. You're just like, wow. Like, and I think that that's where they're, they're really dangerous. Um, and so I don't know if necessarily like he's going to be dangerous in the same way that UCLA was with the quick passes. Um, and I think that might play a little bit better to San Diego State and like what they do compared to what UCLA did. So I agree with you. I think it's stopping the run. You have to make them one dimensional. Um, and then I think you have to, you know, just challenge them and not be afraid to give up that big play, even though I just said that, that was the key and and being able to attack and and see if you can, you know, either get pressure or force the the short pass and then you tackle them. You know, and you and you kind of play that Philadelphia Eagles style, you know, with Buddy Ryan back in the day where you try to make them make the the quick read and then you tackle and, you know, you live with you live with that compared to allowing him to sit back there and then use that phenomenal skill set and that arm that you're talking about where he doesn't have to necessarily be incredibly accurate because you've had to cover him for seven seconds. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like nobody can cover somebody else for seven seconds. Tall task ahead of them, uh, and and you know it'll be interesting to see how it comes out. What, what would you say for the center state and the offensive side? Well, you know UCLA came in; they had only played one game, but they had only allowed fifty six rushing yards to Coastal Carolina, which is really low. Right. Now they're playing Oregon State, that's only allowed fifty one and a half per game for two games. Hey, here it goes. So they're playing an even better run defense. So we always start with San Diego State. Because of where their skill set is and where their bread and butter is, it's running the ball. You know, last week they did not run the ball well at all, and they suffered offensively. You know, we could talk about the missed opportunities in the passing game, but because they had to drop back so much and Maiden throwing 37 times and completing only 50%, they gave up, I think, 10 tackles for loss last week. And, you know, a lot of on-run plays where they got negative yards, that can't happen this week. Right. You can't 
you can't get into second and 14 again or second and 15 and expect to convert those for first downs. Just not what this offense is is excels at right now. And you're putting it behind, you know, behind the sticks and to 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 get to have to pass, drop back and pass to get those first downs. It's not gonna happen. So you gotta do a better job. Don't allow those tackles for losses. You gotta get positive yardage. You know, most coaches will say you want four yards, at least four yards per carry. They didn't meet that last week. They gotta meet that this week. And then you gotta you gotta find big plays like uh, in the passing game, I don't think they have had a, a play over 30 yards. Correct me if I'm wrong on that one. I, I don't think you're wrong on that one. I think their two biggest plays were Jalen Armstead's 48-yard run against Ohio and then um, Jalen Maiden's 56-yard uh, run against Idaho State. I don't think oh. they've had any passing plays that have been you know above 30 yards. So you need some of those. Because to ask the offense to have to go down for eight, nine, ten plays multiple times to score points is going to be hard. So you got to get those those big plays where you score on. Maybe they bust a coverage, or maybe they blow a tackle, and you can get a guy. That's where I think Keenan Kristen is important in this game. We talked wow. about with the UCLA game how he looked like he belonged on the field with pack with Power Five talent. And I think in this case, playing, an, again, another Power 5 team, a top-ranked team, like I think you're going to have to try to get find ways to get Keenan Kristen in space against the linebacker, against the safety, against the corner, where if he can make one guy miss, he can take it 50 yards or 60 yards. And I think those, those are the ways that they can generate points, enough points to stay in the game and possibly win the game. I'm looking right now. Jalen Maiden had a 29-yard pass against Idaho State. I think it was a screen path. I don't know. I'd have to look. I'm just looking at the parts where it says, you know, what was their long and 21 against UCLA. Yeah. yeah. Not, not a lot of them. Not enough of them. I agree. I agree with everything you just said. And I think I, it's interesting because I, I'm not really sure what the reward is, but the way that they're running the football in the sense that, you know, they, they really have gone um, like off tackle a whole bunch, kind of, you know, almost a pitch. <laughs> Or they, yeah. you know, or they've done like a read option, and they've been going in in that hole a bunch, and you know it hasn't led to the big play on the outside very much, and it's been susceptible to you know attacking quick defenders being able to get into the backfield, um, which I think describes Oregon State, and I think in some regards, you know, you, you might just have to go at them. And and go up the middle, and if you if they stop it, well then you get stopped for two yards, you get stopped for you know what I mean, and 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 you just kind of try to set up those you know third and six, third and five, and and you know take the air out of the ball a little bit, you know time of possession has been fine, although you know UCLA is very skewed because of the big plays, um, but I, yeah I think they have to establish the run, I think that's it's it's just who San Diego State is. Uh, in the day and age where everybody's throwing the ball all over, it is the antidote for being able to beat and stay with a more skilled team. I mean, look at Air Force, look at you know Navy and, and Army, and when they're good, I mean, the talent discrepancy between them and, and some of these other schools is is enormous. But yet they can be competitive sometimes, you know, and and it's because they run the football and and when they're good that way. You know, they play much more talented teams, but they just they're not used to facing that. And it seems like a little bit a lot that San Diego State, as they've tried to change their offense now for the third time in six years. It seemed like, you know, they're throwing out the baby with the bathwater too much, which mm. is they, they had something that they were elite at. They had something they were really good at. They had a calling card. They had something that other teams couldn't really, didn't really see. And it and it and it worked to a degree. Um, and obviously when they had better running backs, it worked really well. And it seems like in a lot of ways they they've gotten away from that, trying to be, I guess, more fun and more balanced. And because the passing game has fallen behind and they haven't also improved the passing game. You just you have what they have, which is just nothing that's really really good. 
And so I think that they, they, they have to be able to run the football. And if they're able to run the football, I think it gives them a puncher's chance to be able to, to, to pull the upset. They get some turnovers, which then I would say is the second key. I think they got, they got to get turnovers. So the big play could come by shortening the field because they get a turnover. They, they force a fumble. They get an interception. They get a tip ball to the line of scrimmage, a pass over the middle gets bobbled by a receiver and it goes into the hands of a defender, whatever that is, um, drops a punt. Uh, I, I think they're going to need, you know, to win the turnover margin and then be able to do something with it, you know, not just win the turnover margin and it stops a drive from scoring a touchdown, but, you know, it helps the offense and it goes in the other direction. Yeah, the the other thing that the, the, the UCLA game had a lot of parallels to the Utah game last year. Against Utah, they they stopped Utah's offense, the San Diego State defense, the first four drives of the game. Yeah. They played well. I think they got one turnover or downs and three punts. Right. Playing really well. And then second quarter came. They gave up all three three touchdowns in a row to end the half. And then two touchdowns on the first two drives. So they gave up five touchdown drives in a row. Yeah. UCLA, they stopped them the first two drives. I think they only gave up one first down. And then UCLA scored four out of five touchdowns on four out of five drives to end the half. Hmm. That snowball effect, they have to not let that happen against Oregon State. Like, you give up a touchdown, sure, you're going to give up touchdowns. But to you have to come back, and obviously it helps if the offense comes back and scores, which they did against UCLA the first drive. But you, the defense has to do a better job of not giving up five touchdown drives in a row or four touchdowns in five drives because at that point the game's over. Your offense isn't good enough to keep up with that. So that those games are kind of felt similar to me watching the UCLA game, thinking about that Utah game, and against that noise, against that crowd, they can't let the game get out of hand in the second quarter like those last two games against Pac-12 did because they're not going to have a chance to to get back in the game in the third quarter. I, th- I think I think that's right. You know, I, I think it's a tall task that they have in front of them. Obviously, as you say, playing on the road. Um, I'll be really interested to see if the offensive line woes of, you know, false starts and all that stuff, if that's actually corrected itself and they were able to to not have many of those. And I think, you know, I think that they 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 really need to figure out what they're doing in the secondary because for all of the talk about, you know, how, how deep they are there and whatever you, whichever warrior safety is the primary cover safety, which it seems like they name it differently and how they play it hasn't been great in the slot. Keenan Christian and Brady Hoke. I asked both of them on Tuesday about how they're preparing for the crowd noise. They both talked up a big game that they're going to be prepared for. They're better this year than they were last year. But until you get in that situation, you're not going to know. And so, yeah, last year against Utah, I think the first drives of each half were like three false starts and a delay of game. And that just can't happen against the Oregon State or else it's going to get even uglier than it did against Utah last year. Any other tidbits before we get into predictions? Yeah, um, I, I think the other the other piece of it that is in my mind um, is I'm not really sure if Oregon State is as good as they've looked in their first two games. Um, and how I mean that is when they played San Jose State and thoroughly beat them, San Jose State had played a game and Oregon State had not. And so they had tape to go against the Spartans, did not work the other way. Then they played an FCS school. And clearly their talent was there and they were better. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see because I, I do think that San Diego State has the athletes that are better than both of those other schools. You know, I think the game against San Jose State at the end of the year is going to come down to if San Jose State's quarterback can just be better and, and bridge that gap for them. But, but I, I do have that question because if they're as good as they've looked on tape, they are not the 16th and 17th ranked team in the country. They're a top 10 team. Um, They've looked fabulous. They look like they have all the pieces. I think for them, you know, this is their sternest test to date. And as they're going to be starting to start the conference season, I'm just 
curious to see like is this exact are they this good overall and and where will they be and and um you know, I think there is that question that that's still out there only because of the way their schedule is stacked up. And we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, San Jose State of the Mountain West team. Oregon State is? Is that a first San Jose, Well, it could oh, be. I just, that's a bad joke. <laughs> yeah, the interesting thing is this is a home-and-home home series. Oregon yeah. State is supposed to come to Snapdragon in 2026. Right. If they're, if they're in the same conference, well, that game is going to have to be basically – canceled yeah. doesn't mean that that teams won't play each other they won't it just won't be a non-conference game it will be a conference game so interesting did you speaking of snapdragon did you uh did you see that they've hosted 131 events in the first year that is a lot of events that's something else you know it's interesting too because i know that like when we were you know before the stadium was open and we were talking to adam alar and he was telling us about opening up the different spaces to private events i'll be honest in my mind i was like who's gonna do that like who's gonna rent out part of snapdragon for a private event there's actually been more private events than public events from the article that that came out yeah. um in the business journal i forget the the full thing of it. it's great it's a really good article but how amazing is that 100 and 131 events you know their goal is even more i, I was i was amazed i was i couldn't believe how many and then obviously MLS coming in 2025. So does 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 this allow you to become a Man U fan? That's what I want to know. Absolutely not. <laughs> even with Snapdragon, even with Snapdragon representing San Diego, Qualcomm, local company, gonna provide on the for me. front on the front of the jerseys for Manchester United. There was two years. That I actually watched and rooted for Manchester United. Oh, see, you can go back. It's it's you. you it's a, it's your grandfathered in. But that was because an Armenian soccer player played for Man United for those two years. That's a great. That was it. And then they they uh, exchanged him for Alexi Sanchez, and he went to Arsenal, which has always been kind of my pseudo. You know, back before then, when I was a kid, was was an Arsenal fan and Thierry Henry, and then. Uh, he ended up my Henrik Mkhitaryan ended up on Arsenal around 2017, I think. Uh, but yeah, those are just the only time I ever actually rooted for Manchester United with those, you know, year and a half where he played for them. But that's it. I mean, I, there's no way. No way. No. Yeah, I'm I'm curious to see how how that'll look and just kind of watching them. But yeah, it seems, definitely seems like they're uh, they're kind of like the Yankees. Is that is that accurate? Where where Lots of people love them, and then everybody else kind of hates them. Yeah, although in the last few years they really haven't been that good. Ah, uh, and so, but yeah, they're they're probably the most popular sports brand in the world. Right, right. Like you know, I know obviously the Lakers and the Yankees are huge in the U.S., but Manchester United is global, and those yeah. teams are global too. I'm not saying they're not. Like, but man, soccer is more of a just have more of a global power and global standing. And mm-hmm. Man U is at the top of the line when it comes to that. Now they haven't been great; they haven't had great teams uh, in recent memory, but they still have that power, that staying power. Absolutely, it's, it's a. I was honestly, I was very, very surprised to see Snapdragon as the as the sponsor for that. So I'll be curious to see, you know, uh, did they pronounce the name yet? That's in October, right? SDFC or FCS? Yeah, they haven't full officially announced it, but everyone is pretty much sure it's San Diego FC. Okay. SDFC. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Sorry. This is not a soccer podcast. Although, soccer podcast. San Diego State, 18th ranked. Yeah. That's, that's, and it, and it's interesting because they, they, uh, they had trouble scoring at the first couple of games. And then they've just kind of the the floodgates have opened for them. Um, playing playing some entertaining soccer. Uh, if, if if anyone gets a chance, I've been obviously get to Sports Tech if you can. You know they produce the games. The, yeah. and, and, and so you get you get to watch them. And they had a couple of you know fun like back hill hill you know setting up a, a shot on goal like some some fun play. And you know and their defense has been unbelievable. To this point, you know, they're playing USD at Snapdragon October 14th. Yeah. 
the only problem with some of us is that we'll be in Hawaii to cover the <laughs> SCF yeah, Hawaii it. game. So. I know it. I know it. And I think USD right. is also ranked. Yeah, yeah. That's why that showdown, that you know, cross, cross city showdown. All right, back to Oregon State predictions. Do you want to give me yours first? Sure. I'm going to go that San Diego State is going to do better than expected. I I, I think that the they're going to limit the big plays. They're they're going to score 16 points, um, and they're going to give up 31. Damn, I was going to go 31-20. Okay, well, you can still. Oh, uh, yeah. I was going to go 31 20, the 24 and a half point underdogs. I think that's a lot for this matchup. I think after the performance last week, some of these these guys are going to be ready to, to show that they're better than that or they're a better team, they're better players than that. And I think they will. But it's, it's a little bit too much to ask of this young of a team to go into Corvallis and come away with a victory. So 30, 30, 31 20 is, 31, 20 is, a, is, is, is a puncher's chance. Yeah, and that that's a turnover away from from being right there. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's all the expectations are on Oregon State, and uh, weirder things have happened. And I, I think that the most important part in, of this game is, as you said, figuring out what to do because they got a short week to get ready for Boise State, who you know is going to be doing the read option. A whole bunch. <laughs> this is gonna happen last year. Yeah, I don't want to get too ahead of that, but I was looking at some of the Boise State stats from last week's game, last year's game, and the the rushing yardage from Holani, Gene T, and Green. I mean, it was crazy in that second half. I I, I have never, I, I I've never seen uh, too many defenses that just they just ran the same play over and 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 over. And, over and, over and, over and I, I, it's just, was a, it was a trip, but yeah, yeah. I, th- I, th- I think that there's a lot of, I'm, I'm still curious. Um, I know we said our tidbits and stuff, but I, I'm still really curious about who's playing, who's playing, where, why, um, how they're mixing things up. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to see how good these corners can be. I think you have another good receiving core. I'm excited, man. I'm excited to get out to Corvallis. I'm excited to cover the game, you know, on the road and 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 do our thing, brother. So good stuff. Yeah, have a safe flight, you and Don. Uh, okay. I'm sure I'll be hearing from you throughout the weekend. I'm kind of relishing the fact that, like, I'm not working or covering the game and I can go out and have some beers and watch uh, San Diego State football. No, take lots of notes, man, because, you know, you, you do have the other article. I know. I I. I, there's there's replays. Do your thing, bro. Do you do 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 your thing. It's it's uh, that's the, the freedom of what we do. But yeah, I'm I'm I, yeah. I'm. It's funny because I I uh, I'm like thinking about you know normally I'm sitting there with my my pad and my and and you know my pencil, but like when you're writing the recap, you can't really do that kind of stuff. And so oh. I'm, I'm going to try to get you as as much notes as I can of things that you kind of see around and and. Obviously, get you the 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 press conference quotes and stuff like that. But yeah, a little 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 role reversal. Um, yeah, I, I I apologize to everyone who uh, reads our recaps of every game. You know, it's going to be a different writer. But uh, you know, I'll try to hold down the ship. Fort, you hold on forts I, or ships. I can't wait to see what historical uh, reference you uh, incorporate into your recap article all this time. No, it's, it's super funny because I, I, I'm sitting there and I'm like, is that just too ridiculous? Like, I just, you know, I, 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 I'm finding myself, man. It's like my own like instinct and urges. So uh, maybe we're on the plane. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't done it yet, but I have thought about it like, but no, it should it should be a really really good time. I know there's an Aztec Club event at a hotel um, in Portland uh, that the Don will be going to, and you know, I, I it's 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 what college football is all about, and um, you know, it it should be a great atmosphere and a lot of fun to cover a football game. Yeah, thanks. That's gonna do it for us. Thanks, guys, for listening. Hopefully, you guys are. Looking forward to the game on Saturday, 1230 kickoff. So it's early. 
earlier than usual. So keep that in mind as you're preparing your Saturday afternoon. Thank you as always for listening and we'll talk to you guys next time. You are listening to the SDSU podcast presented by the East Village Times with your hosts, Andre Hagverdian and Paul Garrison. Thank you.